series on Ephesians. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But how many of you like dust? There's a good song called Dust in the Wind. That's the only kind of dust I like is that Dust in the Wind song by Kansas. If I don't know what it is, don't look it up. But dust is something we, we constantly have to fight in our house, right? You, 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 it seems like it always comes up. But I, I, I'll ask you to hold on to your seats here because there's something about dust you may not know. Dust attracts something called dust mites. They're beautiful creatures. Absolutely beautiful creatures. And this is actually a picture of one. Isn't that beautiful? You got these little hairy little things, and they get these little tentacles, and it's just... And what they do is they feed on dead, sin, uh, dead skin cells. So if you guys would like to feed our dust mites today, just go like this, and you'll, you'll probably feed about 1,000 or more of them just by doing that alone. So they, <laughs> I'm not making this up. They actually eat dead sin, uh, sin. I, I, I think it's sin, skin cells. They eat dead skin, uh, skin cells and all sorts of other little proteins that drop out. And I'm not going to mention the other proteins, okay? And that's what they do. And they're, they're real small, the 0.033 millimeters. And, and you cannot see it with a naked, naked eye. In fact, it is a different ecosystem. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that they little cloud. Aren't you glad you came to church today to find something out to horrify you? Okay, and so this is what they're eating. And, and what's so amazing is, look at them. How beautiful they are. They just sit there and they chew on everything. Uh, look at that. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Yeah. So you better dust your house. And by the way, I want to say something else. If you wash your sheets once a week, this is just for free. You want to make sure your laundry machine is at least 130 degrees to kill those little suckers or else they're going to multiply. In fact, in a, in a house that's 1,200 square feet, there's anywhere from a million to 10 million dust mites in your house. Isn't that great? And, and, and some people are allergic to them. But what's so interesting is this is a world within our world. They, you can't see it, but it's right here, right now in this room. There are more dust mites in this room. There's probably about 10 million of them in this room. Don't run out because it's worse out there. At least they're sanctified here. But there are dust mites right here. You don't see them. They don't see you. They're doing their own thing. They're loving your skin, okay? Yeah, in church, we're all about skin. Anyhow, so they like skin. They're eating it right now. They enjoy it. They're in a different world, but we're in the same space, but a different reality is known to each other. I can't see them, but they can see you. So in many ways, the spiritual realm is like that. There is an unseen world that's right here, right now, Pastor, come on. No, I'm not making it up. It's true. There's an unseen world that you cannot see, but it's right here, just like those lovely dust mites. And by the way, this is what they really look like. Maybe you can, oh, no one's there to switch it to the other one. Okay, there it is. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? Let's go back to the first one again. I really like that first one. That's awesome. So uh, we have a, do have a spirit of deliverance ministry for fear. We'll, we'll go ahead and pray for you after the service. So as we go on, I want to encourage you. Uh, we're going through the book of Ephesus, uh, Ephesians, who the apostle Paul wrote to. But I wanted to kind of go ahead a little bit to the section of scripture we're going to spend most of our time on today is what I just talked about. We are living in a world beyond what you see. There is a spiritual realm that's going on. And this life is not just about this life, which we're going to talk more about as well. And so the Apostle Paul is preaching and is teaching in this letter. We'll get more in detail in a few moments. But he says, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, basically saying that um, a lot, Christ is now available, not to just the Jewish people, but the entire church, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery. And that's not an Agatha Christie novel, though I do enjoy those. It is an uncovering which was once concealed, is now revealed, hidden for ages in God. Who created all things. Now, this is the part I want you to focus on. You'll see in a few moments. So that through the church, it was an ecclesia, those called out that meet together. This is not a building. You are, if you're a Jesus Christ, you're an ecclesia, you're called out of the world to live together to be Christ's body. That's called ecclesia, the church. All right? So God has called the church the manifold wisdom of God. 
that God's wisdom, like a manifold on a car, goes in there and then it goes to the different cylinders. God's manifold wisdom comes and it displayed through the church, we'll see in a few moments, of God might now be made known. Now check this out. The manifold wisdom of God should be known to all those far off places. Nope, watch this. Be made known to the what? The rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The Apostle Paul talks about this twice in chapter 1. In verse 1, he mentions the fact that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. In Ephesians chapter 6, it mentions we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities in heavenly places. We find these heavenly places over four times, five times in the book of Ephesians alone. And there is a spiritual realm you're not able to see. But it's actually real, just like those decimites. All right, this is what's going on in heavenly places. Now, what's the significance of that? What's the big deal? Well, check this out, okay? Uh, Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, manifold wisdom of God, be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. God is giving a lesson to the spiritual forces in heavenly places. Your life is not just about you acquiring what you want. Your life's not just about getting enough money to buy a house. Your, 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 your life's not just about getting the right job or meeting the right person or retiring to the right beach or being in the right rocking chair, having a what, okay 401k plan. Your, your life's not just about acquiring things and being happy and living the American dream or even spreading the gospel. There's something even more beyond your life that is actually speaking to the heavenly host. Now, pastor, how is this supposed to help me? This is ridiculous. I don't believe, at first I heard of those aliens from the news, from the news, AP wire. Now you're telling me there's just a bunch of demons and angels flying around here. Is this Harry Potter? No, this is not Harry Potter. This is actually spiritual reality, which I'll, I'm going to share with you in a few moments. There's a reason I'm saying this, by the way. There has a, has a very important reason why this is being said the apostle paul in fact the apostle paul talks about this spiritual places and you can see it so this was according this is the same context here verse 10 right authorities in the heavenly places this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in christ our lord there is an eternal purpose that you and I don't understand completely. For example, this is not a good example, but it's an example. How many of you have ever heard of Van Gogh? The guy who cut his ear off. Yeah. Great artist. Uh, He never experienced in his lifetime the accolades and fame that he now, I don't know if he enjoys it now, but now he's known as a renowned artist. artist. It's cost like a hundred million bucks for his painting or whatever it is now, right? In his lifetime, he never experienced that. Now, it's kind of sad, but do you realize that there are things that happen in the Bible that those that did it did not experience it in their lifetime? You can find this being spoken about in Ephesians chapter 11, where even Abraham had something like eight to 10 descendants when he died. When he passed away, he, he, did not, he was not a father of, of a great nation. There was a handful of people that were there, but he saw afar off. And today, there are literally billions of believers as a result of Abraham. We're here today today of a man's faith but in his lifetime he did not see it he might deem himself she i didn't really accomplish that much in my time but god used him to bless the world and to speak about god's grace upon the planet i want you to hold on to that i'll dissect it a little more and explain it a little better as time goes on so this was according to the eternal purpose that he realized through our christ jesus our lord you see our purpose cannot be understood without knowing our eternal purpose If you try to figure out this life by this life, you're going to be messed up and you're going to be disorderly because you're not supposed to live just for this earth. You're supposed to live beyond this earth and myself included. What has happened is you and I, if we don't need read enough of the Bible and spend time with God, we start listening to the voices around us thinking that life's about acquiring things, acquiring uh, fame, acquiring accolades, acquiring getting happiness, be, having the latest iPhone, having the Google, uh, having the new Apple things that are $3,000 that put you in a virtual reality. If you want to give me one of those, I'll, I don't want it. Thank you. I'll sell it. 
But our purpose cannot be understood without knowing the eternal purpose. Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon, the wisest man, the man that whatever the man wanted, he got. Incidentally, that was David's son. He only lived to be 60 years old. He started off phenomenally. He experienced the presence of, I was just reading this morning through the one-year Bible, that, he, that the, the priests had to fall down when they were dedicating the temple. The presence of God was so strong, it was so thick, there was like a cloud of glory. And he actually had two visitations with God. And this guy that had all those visitations fell away because he got caught up in this world and stopped remembering what it's all about. And this is what he said towards the end part of his life. This is what he said. And I want you to focus on this. And I think it's one of the most important uh, books of the Bible for a variety of reasons. But this is what he says. Everything is what? Meaningless. Just dust in the wind, right? Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Right? He says it's all meaningless. Now, now, this is the key phrase. Everything is meaningless, what does it say? Under the sun. In other words, if you are going to look at this planet and look at your life in this sphere of what's under the sun, it's all meaningless. It's a bad joke without a punchline. It has no meaning. Why is it people are struggling to find meaning, to get high, to do all sorts of things, to start businesses and to rise up and maybe I'll find meaning in my life? And they're not finding meaning. Our purpose cannot be understood without knowing our eternal purpose. And life is meaningless without God. How can you say that? I, have, I know people that have a lot of meaning in their life. Yeah, but they're missing the point. Their life is, is, is moving along a way where it's, they're just living a life of distractions. They're like bugs that are just functioning on instinct and doing what's before them to try to match what these community around them is doing. And, and we don't really know what we're accomplishing. We're on this treadmill. We're on this spinning rat wheel where we're running after a piece of cheese and trying to figure what life's all about. Then you get to the end of your life. What did I really accomplish? You see, your identity leads to your destiny. That's a whole series that's been about this. Now, part of your identity you need to understand, and I need to remind myself of, is that you are eternal beings in temporary bodies. That you are spiritual beings. And right now, on this celestial ball, if you will, we are living here. Now, let me give you a little example of what I'm talking about uh, in a few moments. Uh, we, have the, we have the arms forces, as you know. These are the Army, Navy, Marines. I know now the Space Force. Okay, to deal with all those aliens that we found. Um, <laughs> I have no opinion on that. That's for next week. Maybe Pastor Randy will preach that one about aliens. Are there aliens in the Bible? But that's beside the point. But we, we, we live in this area, right? We live in this world. And your identity determines your destiny. You need to understand that you are an eternal being. That changes the way you live your life. You see, your identity leads to your destiny. We've been talking about that week in and week out, okay? Identity, we cannot find who we are without knowing who God is. And if we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God and think about ourselves. And we remind you, the two most important things that shape your life is what you think about God. If you don't think about God, that affects you. What you think about God and what you think about yourself will actually control everything you do, whether you realize it or not. So if we get that right, and that's what Ephesians does, it actually gives us the right framework. Now, I don't want you being offended by what I'm ready to show you. Gandhi may not be a believer, but he said an amazing phrase that, that is true. We believe, I'm going to reemphasize this, all truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth, okay? Now, just because something's true doesn't mean I embrace everything the person says. But he got this right. Because this actually speaks to what the Bible would speak about. And check this out. This is absolutely true. And this is why it's so important to have the right type of thinking, okay? Your beliefs, what you believe, become your thoughts, okay? Your thoughts become your words. Why is there a great 
plan to get us to change our language. If you change your language, you change your thoughts. There's a redefinition of what it means to be a human being. Now, I don't think there's these diabolical people wringing their hands on some think tank in Washington, D.C., underneath a hotel someplace in a war room, but there are spiritual forces in wicked places that understands that the one major tactic the enemy has used from the Garden of Eden to Jesus in the wilderness, it's all been attacking people's identity. And to define yourself differently, that's the power. That's why we have to be very careful how, what we speak and what we think. So your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions, right? Your actions become your habits. That's why the language matters. Your habits become your values, and your values become your what? It's absolutely correct on this one. Absolutely correct on this. That's why we need to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul does a masterful job of doing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You see, life is meaningless without God. Why did Paul write to the church of Ephesus? Just to remind you, we talked about this in previous weeks. The Apostle Paul went to the temple with a Gentile, and he got arrested because of that. They trumped up false charges he demanded that he be going to Caesar because he's a Roman citizen. He uses Roman citizenship to its utmost. So for about five years, he was incarcerated. He was incarcerated finally in Rome under Nero. Later on, he, he gets left out of prison, by the way, after five years. And then he's out for a bit and he comes back into prison and he's beheaded. But prior to that, he's in prison. I wonder what the Apostle Paul was thinking. I'm trying to spread the gospel, now I'm in prison. Well, guess what he did in those five years? He wrote prison epistles. He wrote Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians. He wrote these amazing books, and we're here today as a result of it on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What would have happened if the Apostle Paul was not incarcerated? I wonder if we would have had these books. So in his time, it didn't make sense, but in our time, it does. So you may not understand, God, why am I going through this scenario? Why am I going through cancer? Why am I going through this divorce? Now, some of it may be your own choice. Some things outside your own purview. But God can take anything and use it for his glory. So the Apostle Paul is here for five years. And by the way, it was a little different than here. There's no tax dollars pays for the prisons. So in order for the Apostle Paul to eat, someone had to send money so he could eat under house arrest. They had to pay for the lodging, they had to pay for the food, and they had to pay for the guard. So for five years, he's chained to this guy, he's a house arrest, people can come in, he's dictating these litter, letters, not litters, letters, and what happens is, it's dictated, and at the end he signs the letter, and so he's talking, and he's actually putting this together. So why did Paul write to the church of Ephesus? Because they were, it was the place he spent the most of his time with, incidentally, and he was writing to a geographical location. It'd be like me writing to southern New England, where we're hitting all the churches and house churches, etc. That's what he was doing. Now, our purpose cannot be understood without knowing our eternal purpose. Life is meaningless without God, and we are spirit. We are spiritual beings, excuse me, we are spiritual beings living in a temporary body and time. We are spiritual beings living in a temporary place. Now, I mentioned the military before. Why did I mention the military? I didn't complete my thought. You have the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Space Force. God has made us to be the ground troops. We're the Army, okay? Okay. You're not asking the army to be the Air Force or the Air Force to be the army. So even though we're seen with Christ in heavenly places, that's our identity is wrapped up in there. Our primary function is in the celestial world. Our primary function is in our five senses. Our primary function is where God has placed us. And we pray to the spiritual. We pray to God. We ask for the kingdom to come and the will to be done. We ask for God to intercede on our behalf, almost like an army officer who's in battle would say, would you please carpet bomb this area so we can get the enemy? And then they, the Air Force comes and drops bombs. And then you have an easier time getting through 
through, but the ground troops still need to go in. You, the church, is the ground troops of Jesus Christ. There are people in the body of Christ right now that are getting out of, out of control. They're trying to go into spiritual realms. They're gathering together and they're laying down on the floor and they're trying to imagine themselves creating universes. It's That's cocky puck. I don't even know what that is. I just made it up. But uh, it's a bunch of nonsense. God does not call us to get into all these little things and try to LSD ourselves into a different realm. That's not what God's called us to do. God's called us to be here, but be aware of the spiritual realm. And nowhere in the Bible they sit around, oh, let's just go here and do, let's do a little trip together. No, that's not what happens. And by the way, that's happening in some places in the body of Christ. Crazy. Okay, the most authority you have is where you're placed. We're placed in the physical world, and God utilizes our church and each other to do it. Why did Jesus, why did God actually, by an angel, visit a man by the name of Cornelius, who was a non-Jewish person, and said, I want you to go to Simon the Tanner's house, and Peter will tell you the work. Why didn't the angel do it himself? Because God delegated authority to mankind on this planet. Okay, and so God is utilizing us. In, we're spiritual beings, but our primary function is in the in the world here. We get involved with spirit. We we fight the world and the spirit. You cannot win a war in in modern warfare. You need both the air force and the ground forces. And if you and I are going to live a life of power, we're going to need to pray in the spiritual forces with God and also march out what He says in His Word. Amen. This is how we have victory. So life is meaningless without God, and we are spiritual beings living in a temporary body. Now, I want to give you an example. In 2 Kings, this is way back. This is after, um, in the Old Testament, there was a prophet by the name of Elisha. I'll just go ahead and read it. And he was a great man of God. He had a servant that was next to him, and he was predicting what was going to happen with a local army. And, so, and they wanted to get rid of Elijah because he had, he had clandestine information. He had inside information, and they, he was thwarting their plans. So they wanted to get rid of him. So they sent an army to, to get rid of him. All right? I don't know if you're tracking with me. And so this is what happened. Then Elijah prayed. His servant was all freaking out. I said, what's going on here? We're surrounded. Elijah prayed and said, oh, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots, fire on around Elijah. If I could hand out to you spiritual ray bands that had the capacity to open your eyes to the spiritual realm, right now there'd be angels and demons and spiritual principalities in this room no matter where you go. The good news is God is stronger than the principalities. The good news is they're trying to get us to do stuff because our authority is on this planet. Does that make sense, everybody? This is true. In fact, I can give you examples. I have a friend of mine, Dave, David, from California. Uh, when he was a teenager, he was at a, at a summer camp. He's playing guitar. There's about 10 people in front of him singing. Behind him was nothing but a lake and some trees. There's nothing behind him but forest by Yosemite. He's sitting there playing guitar, and all of a sudden, he hears this incredible harmonies and like music. Everyone began to weep, like enjoy, and they were like over. There was actually an angelic chorus they're singing, well, I don't know what else to call it, but there was like this supernatural sound, and we've heard it happen to other friends of mine, that there's a spiritual forces. One of my mentors is Dr. Jack Hayford, who's now home with the Lord. He talked about that he was praying at his church in Van Nuys, California, church on the way. It was a small church, 120 people or so, and he was praying, and one day on a Saturday, he was praying, before we had smoke machines, he saw a haze, like a cloud of glory there. And he just, he went in his seat and he felt God's presence. All of a sudden, the church started growing because something happened in the spiritual realm. People gave their lives to Christ and he was a major force within the body of Christ for about 50 years. This stuff happens. There is a, we don't get caught up in it. We don't start a new religion over it because that's not our job. Our job is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our job is to live rightly, Okay. Are you, are you tracking with me? This is true. Pastor, you're out, lost your mind. I, no, I, I'm not losing my mind. I'm just sharing what's in the scripture. I'm convinced of this based upon the scripture, based upon people I know personally that have these experiences. Have I ever experienced angels showing up? Well, I did marry an angel, so yeah, in one way. But I, I sense God's presence here right now when I'm talking to you. I do. I sense I'm, 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 in, I'm participating with the Lord right now. I sense it during worship. Sometimes God gives me words. Sometimes, you know what? It's not about me. It's about God. And so we are working together with Christ Jesus. So 
I want to talk about a party interrupted. How many like to have parties interrupted? You're sitting there with your red cups and the cops come. And there's a lot of that going on right now with his proms and after prom parties, right? There's a party going on and the neighbors call up and there's a party interrupted. Well, Jesus interrupted a party that was going on that he threw. Jesus sent out 72 to disciples. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out, preach the gospel. I want you to lay hands on the sick and cast out demons. Who, me? They said, yeah, I'm giving you authority. So he sent out the 72 disciples. They went out and did it. They cast out demons. Uh, great things happened. People were, people were uh, healed. They had great, they declared the kingdom of God. They came back. They were ecstatic. Lord, even the demons were subject to you in your name. And they're like, a party. You're having a party, right? It's good to celebrate a party. It's like almost like a walk-off home run. Wow, we're excited, right? And, and this is what Jesus says. And then Jesus says, hey, 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 party interrupted, guys. Nevertheless, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He, Jesus was really excited about what was happening. But they said, wait, 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 wait. Hang up, guys. Wait, 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 wait. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but, every time you see a but in Scripture, pay attention, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven or the Lamb's book of life. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because Jesus understood that out of the 12 disciples that were with him at that time, one was going to betray him, and the other 10, other 11, were going to, other 10 were going to have a martyr death, and only one would remain, and he would probably be boiled in oil and mistreated, and all the disciples experienced martyrdom and all kinds of difficult places and times. It wasn't all pie in the sky all the time. Sometimes God released them from prison. Other times they stayed in prison and got beaten and finally killed. So Jesus was saying something very clear. Don't base your happiness on what's happening only. Because you're going to have ups and downs. Ups and downs. I like roller coasters. I do. But I don't like my emotions being roller coasters. I'm happy, I'm sad. I'm happy, I'm sad. I am, I am basically, my emotional well-being is determined by my circumstances. That's a horrible place to live. So what Jesus said, very important here. I want you to rejoice, but I don't want you to rejoice in that. We're going to stop the party. The police are here. Here's what I want you to rejoice. That your names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that heaven is forever. This is the foundation of your life. That's why we can say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. I have a home. I know who I am in Christ. And things may go bad. <laughs> things may go good. But nothing can shake it because Jesus paid the price for me. Amen. That's exciting, everybody. And that's why you'll hear me say the phrase, if you've been in this church any period of time, the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. If you are in hospice, ready to die with cancer, I will look you straight in the eye if you're a follower of Christ. The best days are ahead for those in Christ Jesus. How did I learn this? By reading the word. By having my hope sucked out of me. Didn't believe God existed for a period of time in my early 20s. And in that, I had to find God for myself finally. And I saw through scriptures, through martyrdom and the book of the martyrs, the people that had the greatest joy, even like Stephen. He saw Jesus sitting on the right hand of God the Father. And while stones were being thrown at him, he, they could not stop him because his happiness and his joy was not based upon circumstances on earth, but his position in heaven. Now, why does that matter? Should we still rejoice that people graduate college? Yes. Should we still rejoice that we have a baby boy or girl? Yes. Should we still rejoice if we get into the college, get the job? Yes. That's nothing wrong with that. But all of that is a different strata. You need the foundation strata of your position in Christ. It's unmovable and unshakable. No one can touch it. Then you enjoy your successes here. Praise God. I'm doing well. Things are going great. But don't base it on the circumstances. So when this church is full, praise God, what happens if it's not full? What happens if I mess up? I, I, no, it's about who I am in Christ. Same with you as well. That's why Jesus said this. And that's why the Apostle Paul talks about this as well. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said this, if you read history, 
you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. You see, heaven is where we're going towards. We're spiritual beings. I've used this illustration before, but I'm kind of proud of myself, so I'm going to say it again. I had a friend of mine that was involved with karate, and they decided that they needed to teach me how to defend myself. No, I was just kidding, but they, they, they were cracking boards. These, these little kids are cracking boards. So I tried to do it. I couldn't do it. The father said, hey, hey, come here. Okay, don't look at the board. I'm going to hold the board up. I want you to get your palm. I want you to try to hit my sternum. Don't look at the board. Look at my sternum. So I looked beyond the board, and I popped it, and I broke the wood. So don't mess with me, okay? <laughs> the, the lesson was this. When I was looking at the board, I couldn't break through. When I looked at what was beyond the board, I could break through. When you and I look to where we are in Jesus Christ, and beyond this world, we can break through to new levels. Now, I'm, I need a lot more amening about this. You need to help me out with this. This is true, everybody. This is not pie in the sky. This is not some aliens that you read about in the Associated Press. Charles Spurgeon said this. When we set our mind on things above, we become better stewards of things below. We need an eternal mindset. Or else this doesn't make sense, everybody. Now, how does this work within this book of Ephesians chapter 3? You'll see it in a few moments. Now, we go back to Ephesians chapter 3. Are you tracking with me, everybody? Okay, and we're not going to take a long time going through this and dissecting this because we're spending most of our time on verse 10. But this brings us there. So Paul says, for this reason, he says, for this reason, which he's talked about the first last few chapters, he's dictating this to a, to a scribe. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you heard of the stewardship of God's grace. All of a sudden, he, run, he goes into a run-on sentence. It's almost, I can tell he's a pastor because he went on a rabbit trail. So he's actually going to talk about something. He gets to it later on in verse 14. But he goes, oh, by the way, let me give you some insight who you really are again. And he goes into this amazing uh, rabbit trail that is so powerful. And he says the following, okay? You've heard the stewardship of God's grace. God's grace is unmerited favor that was given to me for you. Remember, the apostle Paul was against Jesus Christ, was against the Jewish people coming their lives to Christ. And then God used him, a Jew of all Jews, to be the apostle to the Gentiles, which are non-Jewish people, which was made known to the sons of men in, order, in, in other generations as has now been revealed. His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, this mystery doesn't mean an Agatha Christie novel. Mystery means an uncovering. Oh, that's what it's about, okay? This mystery is that the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, are fellow heirs, which basically means that the, the, the Jewish people were called to be separate from everybody else. But if you remember in Genesis chapter 12, God always had it in his purposes to reach the world through the Jewish people. He says, by you you, all nations will be blessed. And so now God has included us all in it. Doesn't mean we replace the Jewish people. We do not replace them. They're still Jewish people. They're still God's firstborn, but we're all equal in value because of what Christ Jesus has done. That's what the apostle Paul is saying. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation. He had a revelation. God showed him as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight to the mystery of Christ, members of the same, we're the members of the same body. We, you know, people say, well, I like church, but I don't like, I like Jesus, but I don't like the body. Listen, everybody, that doesn't work. The body of Christ, you need to be committed to a local set of believers, whether it's here or someplace else. It's important. God works through the body of the church, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. On this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his dunamis, his power. 
to me through I am the very least of all the saints. Now, the Apostle Paul is not patronizing them. The Apostle Paul is realizing what I'm realizing. I hope you realize the same. The closer I get to Jesus, the more I understand who Jesus is, the more beautiful and wonderful and powerful I see who Christ is, the more I realize, oh my Lord, I need God. I'm a mess without him. I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. I'm not even a bag of chips anymore. I need God. And anyone that is arrogant and is full of themselves has a distorted view of God. Because if you see yourself next to God, you realize you're nothing without him and everything with him. And it's by grace you've been saved, not by works, lest any man can boast. So we're going to need to move forward here a little bit, okay? Who created all things so that through the church, through the church, here we go, through the church, God's people, the manifold wisdom, there's a manifold on a car, and that's where the fuel goes, and it distributes to the different cylinders. So what happens is God goes through us, and we have different cylinders. We have different uh, attributes. We have different ethnicities. We have different gifts, but the manifold wisdom of God comes through us. Now, check this out. Manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. And wait a minute, I thought we're supposed to spread the gospel to the earth. Yeah, but God is using us as a test case. He's using us to speak to the angels and demons that are watching us. You can see this in the book of Job. You can see this all throughout the scriptures, by the way. In fact, why is God doing this? Let me give you an example. Right now, if you were a lawyer and you're going before the court, what they often do in ruling cases is you would go and look at a previous case, pull that book off the shelf, look at Johnson versus Hillary, or not Hillary, Johnson versus... <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. Johnson versus Smith, and you find out that in this case, they ruled this way. So by looking at that case, you have been taught, you've been, you learned something by observation in that case. Now you can rule differently. In the same way, the angels and demons are looking at us. This is, our, this is God's brief. We're his brief. We're actually showing the angels and demons. In fact, this is a job rehearsal. This is a job interview that how you act down here will determine your position in heaven. You're not going to be sitting on a cloud shooting arrows and cupids with naked babies, God's going to have you actually do something in creation as we can see in the book of uh, Genesis where Adam was naming the animals. He was part of the process of God's uh, declaration of his creation. So you and I are going to have jobs. This is a job interview. All right? So made known to their also what's happening. They're watching us. They're learning from us. The Bible says that one day, don't you know you're going to judge angels? Right now we're lower than angels, but one day we're going to be above angels. Okay, God is, they're watching us. Let me give you another example as we're running a little low on time here. We just love bugs. I was going to bring an ant farm today. My wife ran out to Martin's and Noble to pick one up, but the ants died. Uh, this is the queen ant. Uh, by the way, they're expensive. Amazon, the cheap one's about $45, expensive one's $150 for an ant. These are the drones, the guys. They live about eight months. You know how long these things last? Up to 30 years. Yeah. That's why you can't get rid of those ants. Okay? So now, why am I talking about this? What does this have to do with the Apostle Paul? Well, Pastor, you're getting, you're, you're, no, no, this is not an ADD moment. Sponsored by Ridley. No, this is what it is. What does he say here? Go to the what? Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers it food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? Okay, now what's happening here, let me explain what's happening. By watching the ants, the ants are giving us a sermon and that we're learning from the ants. In the same way, differently of course, the heavenly Coast and the different angels and demons are watching us and they're giving lessons from us. That what happens here matters. You may not see the fruition of what takes place here until heaven one day. That God is teaching them these lessons. In fact, some of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life were not in church. They were going in nature. Behold the heavens. They speak of the glory of God. I'll look at one time I saw these ducks, I know, I'm going to like the, these ducks swimming, and all of a sudden one duck went down and his, uh, uh, put his head underneath. The next thing you know, all the other ducks did the same thing. They're all following it. And the Lord's like, see how you guys are? One does something, you all copy each other. And I, kinda, I got a sermon from that, and it's actually pretty good. What happens? God speaks through nature. 
Well, God's speaking to the principalities and the angels in the heavenly places about what's going on here. Our life matters. The church is an annual. The church is a declaration, not only for people here, but for the heavenlies. So your word, your mind, your worth, the church, your life means more than just the here and now. So this is the problem. You may not understand why God is doing what he's doing. God, why did my mother die of cancer? God, why did the person die of a car accident? God, well, I don't know. I do not know all the answers. And like that dust mite, they don't understand why there's no more skin cells coming anymore. You don't understand it all, but one day you will in heaven. So we have to trust God. Doesn't mean we don't have questions. Doesn't mean you won't ask questions. But it comes a point that you're not, if you understood God, that would make you God. If you can understand God, you're God. God's God because he's God. And one day it's all going to make sense. I'm convinced of it. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, and I ask the worship team to make their way up, made known to the rules and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purposes that he realized in Christ. Our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I want to conclude with these, uh, these lessons quickly. Our purpose cannot be understood without knowing our eternal purpose. Life is meaningless without God. God is our eternal purpose. We are spiritual beings living in a temporary body and time. Does it make a difference what happens here? Absolutely. The angels are watching us. This is the time for heroes. Once we go to the other side, it's over. The battle's over. They're in the stands of heaven talking about what we're doing right now. This is the place where legends are made of, and your life might be a legend. You don't realize what God is doing in your life. Whether you're 88 years old or 98 years old or 8 year old, if you're doing what God's calling you to do, you can make an impact that no one's even going to know about this side of heaven. So we're spiritual beings living in a temporary body and time. Focus upon who you are in Christ in eternity. Set your minds on things that are above. Remember, you want to break that wood. You go to the sternum, the heart of God. You go after the heart of God, you'll break through this earth to another level. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on the earth. Now here is a very important scripture verse. If Jesus found this necessary, so shall we. Looking to who? The founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the what? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Even if I'm depressed, I have a little bit of joy. Because I know the best days are ahead in Christ Jesus. Right? So, Look into Jesus, the founder and professor of our faith, who for the joy that was what? Jesus had to set joy before him. What was the joy before him? And during the cross, despite the shame and is seated at the right, he set what was going to happen. He was going to kill death. He was going to raise again from the dead. He was going to be with us for eternity. So Jesus put the joy of his eternal position before him to get through the temporary pain. This is how we overcome. This is what make the martyrs, this is how they're overcoming. They see what's beyond here. If you and I are going to live beyond here, we have to understand that we're seeing with Christ in heavenly places and that we are actually telling a story that the celestial beings, that the angels and demons are looking at, they're wondering about, it even talks about in the Bible. There's so much more we could say about it, but we keep our focus on what God's called us to do. Understand there's a spiritual world. We're like the army that has to do its drills, but understands there's an air force. And we work together in Christ Jesus. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering. He says, guys, I'm suffering. And you know what he says? He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He actually says that. No, he's a prisoner of Rome. No, he's not. He's in God's purposes. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. For God's purposes. I don't have time to go any further than that in today, but I wanted to encourage you that we're to focus upon who you are in Christ for eternity. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, I've been doing my very best to try to communicate the truth I know that is very clear in Scripture, that this is not all there is. Lord, the fact of the matter, Lord, is very clear that we are eternal beings living in a temporary place. And that one day we'll be with you in Christ, in heaven, if we've given our lives to you. And Father, sometimes we don't understand why things happen. 
because we have a relationship with you, you're okay with us asking questions with humility. But Father, I pray in Jesus' name right now that you begin to relieve people of the desire to understand it all. And Lord, I pray instead we would understand all that comes from you. Lord God, we want to trust you. We want to believe in you. We want to give our lives to you, Jesus. And Father, forgive us for living for temporary things. Forgive us for basing our, our happiness based on happenstance. Lord, we want to shift our thought processes to our eternal home, that who we are in you, that we are eternal beings and temporary bodies. With that knowledge, Lord, we want to enjoy the great things you give us now, the fact that we could be here together, the fact we have family and friends. Lord, we want to thank you for those things, but we recognize that those things come and go, but the promise of you forever and ever remains forever, and we stand on that foundation, and because of that foundation is there, that we know that, Lord God, the best days are ahead for us in you. So, Lord, I pray that we would stop chasing the carrots of our culture, stop chasing materialism, stop chasing accolades and popularity and comfort and, and retirement and schools and girlfriend and boyfriends and all this other stuff that is not bad within itself. Father, instead, we fix our eyes upon you. You're the author and you're the completer of our faith. Lord, mature us, I pray, in the days that are coming, in Jesus' name.